Well, good morning. My name is Bob Wakeman. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and I'll be moderating this morning's session. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the agenda or the schedule that you have is going to be reversed this morning. So first we'll be he hearing from Susan Knight, and then Rebecca Power will, uh, will take us home. Uh, I'd like to introduce Susan Knight. She's one of my favorite people. I've known her for a number of years and always enjoyed listening to Susan. She was born in Massachusetts and was an undergraduate at Dartmouth College. She received her PhD from UW-Madison in the Botany Department. She's the Interim Director of the Trout Lake Station, a field station for the University of Wisconsin-Madison Center for Limnology in Boulder Junction. Her work involves research on aquatic invasive plants, aquatic plant identification, plant surveys, and technical review of statewide lake management plans. She is fascinated by bogs, and is especially fond of bladderworts and other carnivorous plants. She spends her spare time biking and cross-country skiing, and if you ever get a chance to see Susan do her impression of a bladderwort, <laughs> it is worth the price of admission. <laughs> Susan will uh, present today on In Lake Ecology 101, so here we go. Susan, Thanks very much. Are you going to give me a little warning? or something? I'll give you five. Five. That? Okay, great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so everything you ever wanted to know about lakes in 40 minutes. So not, not much of a challenge. Of course, uh, most places, if you go to take limnology as an undergraduate, they'll give you 16 weeks. So uh, this is going to be a little a bit of an abbreviation. I'm going to make an effort to uh, leave some time for questions, so hopefully I can answer it. So, but as Bob said, I'm really a plant biologist, not really, well, I guess that counts as a limnologist, but anyway, uh, the chemistry and physics and all that kind of stuff is not really my forte, but we'll give it a go. So, this is what I would, uh, most people, when they think about lakes, they're talking about lakes and streams and wetlands and groundwater. Now today, I'm really going to focus on just the lakes, but this is really the whole topic of limnology. It's the inland waters. And so it uh, uh, pertains to all of our uh, wet, lakey um, water that we have inland, not including the, uh, the oceans, et cetera. And one of the things about these uh, limnology that I like the best is that it, you need to know a little bit about a lot of things. So it's kind of like ecology in general, but kind of even more so. You have to know some physics. We'll talk about the physics of lakes in just a minute. You have to know a fair amount of chemistry, and you need to know a fair amount of biology. So it really spans the gamut. And <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you need to know a little bit about those. And of course, all of those interact so that you can um, learn what you need to know about the lakes. So these are our lakes in Wisconsin. So many lakes and so little time to visit them all. So the, uh, we have so many lakes. This is where I live, up in the north, uh, northern part of the state, Northern Highland American Legion area, Northern Highland. So many lakes over here by Rice Lake. Lots of lakes down here in the southeast, up here in the central part of the state. So many lakes. So when we have so many lakes, what do we want to do? We want to compare them, at least as a scientist. That's what you want to do. You want to say, why is this one different from that one? Why is this one um, nutrient poor? Why is this one nutrient rich? Why does this one have walleye and this one only has mud minnows? So all these cool questions you can ask, Wisconsin is the ideal place to ask them. So why do uh, neighboring lakes differ? First of all, there's the area. Uh, some of them are really tiny and some of them are really huge. The chemistry varies hugely, and why is that? It has to do with landscape position. I'm going to get into that in just a second. But you know, the first time I ever flew into Wisconsin, I flew into Green Bay, and I thought, and I came from Colorado, and I thought, wow, this place is flat. But as we probably all know, especially if you bike, <laughs> there are a lot of hills, too. So there are differences in how high the uh, lakes are in the landscape, and it has a huge um, impact on the chemistry of the lake. The other thing is nutrients, and that largely goes along with the landscape position, um, what is controlling uh, how the lakes are different. Some of the lakes are very susceptible to acidification, and so that's another big difference in our lakes. 
uh, the color can be very different. I'm sure many of you have, you know, hopefully you're on, you live on a nice blue lake, which is reflecting the sky mostly, but sometimes they can be very green and that's usually because they've got a lot of algae in them. And sometimes they're very brown, and that's usually because they've got uh, dissolved organic carbon and they've got tannins dissolved in it, often if they're dominated by a wetland. So the watercolor can be very different. The water clarity, um, if it's green and you know kind of algae rich, it's usually not very clear. Sometimes the blue lakes are remarkably clear, and even the brown lakes can be very clear. So stained, but clear. So those things are all ways in which um, lakes differ, of course, then we get into the humans and whether or not there are a lot of humans on the lake uh, using boats or on the shoreline. That uh, has a lot to do with how lakes are different and the number of fish. Finally, I'm sure we've got some fishermen out here, some anglers, and some lakes not worth fishing and some that's why you go. So, and most of you probably live on a lake and uh, you're very attached to your lake. I know everybody talks about their own lake. And so you like to think about what's going on on your lake, but it's very important that you remember that we live in a landscape of lakes. And so you have not only, we've got um, uh, Fallison Lake here, Crystal Lake, uh, Firefly Lake up here, but these lakes do not um, exist in isolation. They are part of a whole landscape of lakes. Here you've got Big Muskie up there. These are all lakes up in the Northern Highland area and they influence each other so they're not solitary. And I just want everybody to keep in mind that um, we live in a landscape of lakes, especially in certain parts of the state. So let's get back to the landscape just a little bit. So some of the lakes are very high in the landscape. This would be a lake that has only got well, where does the water come from, first of all? Where does the water come from? Of course, we all, all the lakes get precipitation and they're all getting rain and a lot of them are getting snow today. So uh, we know that there's a lot of precipitation coming down and some lakes, that's really all they get. They don't get much groundwater coming in. They're kind of perched above the water, not above the water table, but the way the groundwater works, they're not getting a whole lot of groundwater in. Most are maybe getting a little bit. And then some lakes that might be slightly lower in the landscape, they're getting all that precipitation, but they're getting more groundwater from other lakes that might be upstream or from the groundwater coming in. As you get further down in the landscape, maybe there's an intermittent stream coming into a lake and that will really change what your chemistry and um, what the lake is like. And then you get a little bit further downstream and maybe you've got a, a, an actual overland stream coming into your lake. And so um, that will change the lowland lakes that have streams coming in are usually quite different from our lakes that are high in the landscape. These are called seepage lakes up here and seepage lakes can have almost no groundwater coming in or a fair amount of groundwater coming in. And most of them will have some groundwater going out. But these lakes down here, if it's, got a, if it's, got, if it's drained but doesn't really have anything coming in, we usually call that a drained lake or a, or a headwater lake. And then as you get down lower in the landscape, then these are drainage lakes and they usually have very different chemistries than the, the lakes further up. This is another way to look at the whole thing. We've got precipitation coming down on all of them groundwater coming into most of them and sometimes some streams coming in as well. So the important elements, we're on to chemistry a little bit. Um, and uh, the important compounds and elements that we have that are important in lakes is our oxygen, phosphorus, nitrogen, the alkalinity, which is sort of a chemical process, specific conductance, pH, and water. Water is really weird. Why is water weird? Because I don't exactly have a diagram of this, but I think you can all imagine this. Water is an unusual compound in that it is densest when it's at four degrees centigrade, which is about the temperature of your refrigerator. So let's say 39, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Water is its densest, so water is going to sink. Um, water that's that temperature is going to be at the bottom of your lake. At what temperature is water the least dense? This is a question for the audience. Well, it's just about 32. When it's frozen, it is the least dense because our ice floats on top, right? But we also have water that's just a little bit um, warmer than 39 degrees, um, the water down on the bottom. That's also a little bit uh, less dense. So it leads to some very strange 
sort of configurations of the lake. And when I talk about stratification, we'll come back to that a little bit. But water is a very unusual compound in that it's densest at four degrees and then slightly less dense on the other ends, either warmer or colder. So what about oxygen? Why do we need oxygen? Of course, all organisms need oxygen for respiration, not only animals, but plants. And so the more oxygen you've got in the lake, um, usually the better. You can kind of overdo it, but oxygen is extremely important. Phosphorus is extremely important. We've got phosphorus. Um, uh, pretty much everybody knows the more phosphorus you have, the more algae you have in your lake. So, uh, and I'm going to um, emphasize phosphorus and nitrogen here in just a second. Alkalinity is how well buffered the lake is. It's kind of like Alka-Seltzer. If your lake is well buffered, you can tolerate some acidity coming in or even some basic um, uh, chemistry coming in and your lake will kind of um, even things out and won't be so affected. Um, conductance is how many ions you have that could conduct, conduct electricity. And that is um, a big uh, has a lot to do with uh, what the nature of the, the lake is and what kind of organisms can grow in it. pH, uh, neutral pH is seven. Our lakes hover around that. Some of our bog lakes are down around five, and some of our very um, alkaline lakes are might get up to eight and a half or so. But we're sort of hovering around the the seven, or around the around the the neutral point. And I already talked about how weird water is, but thank goodness it is because um, it accounts for uh, our seasonality. All of those chemicals are inextricably linked to the um, biological processes. And first of all, we have primary productivity. And what is that? That is photosynthesis, basically. That's um, uh, organisms that have green, have chlorophyll. They're going to take carbon dioxide and water. We've got plenty of uh, carbon dioxide is dissolved in the water. And, um, we're going, and we've got plenty of water, for sure. And that plants are, and the algae are able to turn that into sugar and oxygen. So as a byproduct of photosynthesis, we're getting oxygen, which is also a very good thing. And that is the basis of the food chain. So the um, plankton, the algae, are providing most of the base of the food chain. They're making more of themselves that is then available as food for other organisms higher in the, in the food web. So higher up in the food web, we have zooplankton, which are microscopic uh, shrimp-like organisms. I'm sure most of you know what those are. Um, there are lots and lots of different kinds, different kinds that um, there's a seasonality to them. Some are present in the spring, some in the fall. And, uh, and in some lakes, you've got one kind. In other lakes, you've got another kind. So there's a whole array of zooplankton. You've got lots of other invertebrates that are present in lakes, um, all sorts of insects, larvae, uh, crayfish, um, mussels and clams, um, all kinds of uh, invertebrates that are that next tier of productivity in our lakes. So we start with primary productivity, mostly the algae. We do have plants as well that are sometimes eaten, but the real primary pro producers are the algae in the lake. And then we get up to the forage fish, and the forage fish are eating mostly zooplankton and invertebra other invertebrates. So they're the next tier. And then finally, we get the large fish, which a lot of us are interested in trying to catch. And so here is uh, kind of our food web. And as I said, it's inextricably linked to all the chemistry that kind of came before and is, an ex and is uh, the reason why we have some lakes have certain large fish or certain kind of phytoplankton goes all the way back to why we, uh, they're different chemically and physically. So a little bit more on the nutrients because they are important. Phosphorus and nitrogen are the two most important. Phosphorus is most often the limiting nutrient in a lake. Not always, but often. That means that there's plenty of other stuff and your algae are going to churn and start producing more of themselves the more phosphorus you have. So more phosphorus often means more algae. More algae often means greener lakes. And greener water, sometimes, if it gets really bad, means you've got an impaired water. So that's not good. And you might have heard other talks today talking about why you want to limit phosphorus coming in off of agriculture, construction. Some of the phosphorus is just natural. There's just going to be phosphorus in our lakes. Nitrogen is less often the limiting factor, but it can be. Um, some cyanobacteria, those are also known as blue-green algae, can fix nitrogen. So if you've got plenty of phosphorus, like you've got some runoff from a, from a farm or something like that, then the cyanobacteria can really kick in um, 
take nitrogen right out of the air, turn it into a usable form, and they can really go to town. So in lakes with plenty of phosphorus, you may get these nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria blooms um, in certain parts of the year. So I'm going to come back to that in a second, but for now I want to talk about stratification. So now we're going back to physics. So what is uh, stratification? This comes back to that weird water and the weird phenomenon of how water reacts at different temperatures. So let's start in winter, since that's where we are. We've got lots of ice on our lakes up where I am. We've still got close to 70 centimeters of ice on Trout Lake. Pretty amazing uh, winter. So, and as I said, the ice is the least dense form of water because it floats on top. Just do a little thought experiment. If the ice were not less dense, but actually more dense, which is more common in compounds that you're most dense when you're solid, um, that's not the case of water. So what would happen if the lake were actually, if the ice was actually heavier? Well, what would happen is you'd form some ice because it's cold out, right? And it would sink. And then the water up on top would freeze again because it's cold, and it would sink. And then more water would form on top, or more ice would form on top, and it would sink. And in no time at all, you have a lake that is top to bottom frozen. Okay? Luckily, that doesn't happen, because as you can probably imagine, uh, our lakes would not be viable. We wouldn't have anything alive. At least, we wouldn't have any fish, for sure. And, so, and it probably wouldn't even melt all that much in the summer. So it's a very good thing that we have that water is as weird as it is and that the ice stays up right up on top. So usually for most lakes, the lake is uh, deep enough that the ice does not form all the way to the bottom. So then what happens? Then you've got spring. So the ice melts. And remember, our water is coldest down there. I've got 4 degrees centigrade. That's like 39, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And spring comes, and the ice melts. And so this water is now warming up to more than 32. And at some point, it's going to reach 4 degrees, right? which is the same temperature as that water down at the bottom. A little wind kicks up, and that water and the whole lake will kind of mix and turn over. And so you get whatever was down in the bottom. Um, get at least some of those nutrients get mixed up. It's not really like a washing machine or anything. It's not like it's turbid and stuff. But there's definitely some interaction from the bottom all the way up to the top. OK, so that's happening in spring. What happens in summer? In summer, we've still got that cold water way down there on the bottom. And this is in a lake that's deep enough to do this. And the summer, of course, we get nice warm weather. And the surface water warms up quite a bit, maybe up into the 20s, 20, you know, 20, 25 degrees uh, centigrade. And because water, when it's at different densities, has a resistance to mixing, what happens is you get this cold water down here, you get this warm water up here, and they don't mix. I know that sounds really weird um, that they don't, but they actually form layers. There's actually a resistance to uh, mixing because of this difference in density at different temperatures. And we have some really cool demonstrations that we can do very quickly. I didn't bring it here because I figured the room would be pr pretty cold. But you can take a little container, put warm water on one side, cold water on the other side. Let's we say we make the cold water blue, and we'll make the warm water red. No difference, just different colors. And then you take a little divider out, and you pull it out. And what happens? The cold water goes right down to the bottom, and the warm water floats on top. And it'll sort of slosh around a little bit. But then it'll steady out, and you'll see this red layer on top and this cold layer down on the bottom. So we're not talking about it ice at this point, but just warm and cold water definitely forms layers. And there's a resistance to, um, to turning. Then as we continue down into fall, um, we have uh, the warm water up at the top starts to cool off as it gets colder and colder. And pretty soon, it's the same temperature as that water down at the bottom. And again, we get mixing. And any nutrients that are down at the bottom are brought up to the top. And you can often get another bloom in the, the spring because you've got new nutrients um, being brought back up to the surface. And the reason that you, know, you need light in order for these algae to photosynthesize, but if they've run out of nutrients in the fall, they'll get resuscitated. So then they have light, and they've got nutrients, and you can often get a little bloom. Okay.
Now, not all lakes are deep enough for this to happen. Most lakes, um, it kind of depends on the shape of the lake and everything, but 18 or 20 feet is usually about how deep a lake has to be in order for this stratification to, take, to set up so that you've got warm water on top and cold water in the bottom all summer long. So there are shallow lakes. Um, they don't usually stratify or they don't stratify for the entire summer and there's everything in between. They might stratify for a couple of weeks and then get disrupted. Um, so not all lakes go through this stratification. Really, it's only the deeper ones. So now we're going to combine the phosphorus idea and the stratification idea. So hopefully you've been paying attention. You remember what stratification is and you remember how important phosphorus is. So the problem is that there may not be any oxygen at the bottom of a lake in the middle of the summer. And when there's no oxygen, the phosphorus is not bound to iron. Normally it would be. So I know we're getting into the, the weeds here a little bit, but the phosphorus is sort of available. I sort of like to think of it as down at the bottom of the lake where there aren't any, uh, where there isn't any oxygen, the phosphorus is kind of like prisoners, all right? And, they're, and the iron are the prison guards. And the prison guards know that the phosphorus can't escape because there are gates up all around the prison. And so, you know, they're just, they're not paying much attention. As soon as you get a lake that turns over, now the prison gates have been thrown open and the prison guards say, uh-oh, better go capture that phosphorus because now there's oxygen around and the, and the guards go into action. So now the phosphorus, the guards go, which are iron, are gonna go and capture all of the phosphorus and bring it back down. But they can't do it immediately. So for a short time, when, um, the oxygen, when the lake starts to turn over, even though there's some um, oxygen getting mixed in with that phosphorus and iron, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the, some of the phosphorus is able to be taken up by algae. So when a stratified lake turns over in the spring and the fall, the phosphorus rich and the iron and the oxygen poor water at the bottom circulates and that's when you often can get an algal bloom. So shallow lakes mix frequently, and they have sort of a different dynamic there. Hope I didn't confuse everybody with my cops and robbers diagram. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about biology. When we talk about lake zones, we're uh, uh, gonna leave the, the chemistry and the physics behind for a minute. We have the uh, littoral zone, which is where the plants w live. And so there has to be enough light for the plants to grow all the way up from the bottom. So this, uh, usually you've got terrestrial plants up here, emergent plants that have their, their ankles in the water and sticking up out into the air. And then a little deeper, you've got floating plants and they can only go down to about six or seven feet. And then you get submerged plants and they'll grow as long as the water is clear enough for um, the plants to grow. Um, the littoral zone is where a lot of the action is happening on the shore of a lake. Here's a lovely picture of pickerel weed and some pond lilies. And there's lots going on down here uh, in the littoral zone, down lots of uh, algae on the plants and they're being eaten by other, um, either uh, by invertebrates that are grazing on these um, algae that are attached to the plants and lots of invertebrates that are eating each other. So there's lots of things uh, biologically going on in the, um, in the uh, littoral zone. And the wood itself is very important because it gets, I'm sure you've all seen, kind of a scum of algae all over the, the wood and that leads to grazers and this is where a lot of fish will have their um, lay their eggs and it'll be kind of a nursery for all kinds of organisms. Down here where you've got the wood and the plants and the algae in the littoral zone, they're extremely important to the lake ecosystem. The food webs, we've talked a little bit about, we talked about photosynthesis and how that's where carbon dioxide and water gets combined by the, um, mostly the algae and those algae might be free floating, those are the phytoplankton, or they might be attached, and those are usually called paraphyton or epiphyton. And they make sugar and they make more of themselves. So the photosynthesis is being carried out by the algae and the plants, the zooplankton eat the algae, the small fish eat the zooplankton, and the large fish eat the smaller fish, and the large fish are eaten um, by, uh, the large fish eaters eat large fish, and uh, that includes uh, eagles and us. Look at that person with that giant, looks like a muskie or something. So, and this is kind of called our trophic cascade where uh, things are, um, you, you've got this whole food web and things are eating whatever is in the food web down uh, just 
in the previous tier. Trophic state is uh, some terms that you might have heard. Um, we generally think of um, how much nutrients are in a lake in, as either oligotrophic. Oligo means few, so you've got few nutrients. And these are our lakes that are very clear, uh, often not very mucky, um, might be quite deep. Well, they're not all deep. You can have an oligotrophic shallow lake as well. But generally, there's not a whole lot in them. Uh, the next layer up is mesotrophic. These lakes, uh, perhaps the majority of our Wisconsin lakes, have some nutrients and uh, support algae and all the other parts of the food web um, to a certain extent. And then finally, you get eutrophic, eu uh, meaning true uh, uh, food. And th these lakes are, have extremely high nutrients and sometimes higher than perhaps you would want. Perhaps they're actually impaired. Um, and there's just too many nutrients coming in, either because of uh, human activity. Um, there are eutrophic lakes that are naturally eutrophic, um, but these days uh, humans are mostly are responsible for most of the eutrophic lakes. So I'm going to touch on now just a few lake issues that are important. Um, there's human caused eutrophication, invasive species, climate change, shoreland destruction, pollution and lake level changes. So we've got, um, first of all, human caused eutrophication. Um, this is what we were, I was just talking about. If you add a tremendous amount of phosphorus to lake, you're going to get that much more algae growing in the lake and it's going to uh, feed um, scummy algal blooms. But even if you don't have, oopsie, sorry about that, uh, real scummy algal blooms like that, this is Minocqua. And uh, you can see that there's a high density of houses, even though it's up in the North Woods, and you don't think of them as having um, issues like this. But there are, you can get such a high number of people uh, living in one place or construction, you don't even have to have a, form, a farm to have some issues of eutrophication where there's a lot of nutrients going into the lake, either from lawns or from, um, from runoff. So um, it's one of the things that humans can really control. And so uh, recommend that you do your utmost to prevent nutrients from going into the nearby water body. Invasive species, um, people certainly don't need an education about invasive species. We all know that these are the bane of our existence often. We've got invasive species that are plants, such as Eurasian water milfoil. Um, here you can see a lake that's very soupy and green, but also has a tremendous population of Eurasian water milfoil right up at the surface. And uh, so this can be a problem uh, largely for uh, recreation, but also they tend to uh, dominate and to kind of take over um, uh, the, the lake and make it sometimes unsuitable for other species. Curly leaf pondweed is another species that we have. These invasive species that we have all tend to do the same thing. They, there's nothing really wrong with them by themselves, but they grow up to the surface and then they just keep on growing and so they form a mat up at the surface and that's really um, uh, mostly a problem for us humans and plus they are um, just taking up so much of the space of the lake that other things are, are, are knocked out. Of course, we also have um, invasive animals We've got zebra mussels that are forming, um, have really taken over a number of water bodies. Um, and we've got spiny water fleas. One of the odd things about zebra mussels is that, um, well, they're filter feeders. And so they're sucking in water, taking out algae for the most part, and spitting out clear water. And uh, so in some ways, in some lakes, that's led to uh, increasing water clarity. But it can also lead to other problems like getting bottom layers of uh, Cladophora and other algae that can cause their own um, trouble. Um, and then you've got spiny water fleas, which are in not too many lakes in Wisconsin. Um, but one of the sort of poster children for spiny water fleas and zebra mussels is Lake Mendota down in Madison. And um, the interesting thing is that zebra mussels, you would think, would be clearing up the lake. But spiny water fleas um, are kind of having the opposite effect. Spiny water fleas is a zooplankton, and it's a, it's a very large zooplankton. 
And so usually we think of zooplankton as being the good guys. They're eating the algae, especially keeping them in check so that if you've got phosphorus, the algae grow, but the daphnia and the other zooplankton kind of crop it down and keep the, still keep the lakes reasonably cl uh, clear. But spiny water flea is a giant um, zooplankton, and it eats the smaller zooplankton that would normally be cropping down the algae. So it's kind of a disruption of the food web. And so it's interesting that in Lake Mendota, we now have both zebra mussels and spiny water fleas kind of battling out um, in this lake. And uh, uh, Professor Jake van der Zanden at the Center for Limnology and his graduate students are working on this um, kind of uh, interesting interaction of these invasive organisms to see what is going to happen in Lake Mendota. Right now, uh, it's pretty green. Uh, well, maybe not this moment, but um, the lake is pretty eutrophic. Um, not all the responsibility of spiny water fleas. It's had a long history of high levels of phosphorus coming into that lake. But it will be interesting to see what happens, and in some of the other lakes where both of these are occurring. Climate change is another really important problem in, um, or could be an important problem for lakes. Uh, this is a photo of Dr. John Magnuson, a former director at the Center for Limnology. And he has been studying climate change and the evidence of climate change from lakes for many years. This graph up here is a timeline of ice duration. So back here, we've got 1850. Up here is towards the present. And this is what they have kept track of all this time, is when the ice goes on and when the ice comes off, and how long that span is in the middle. And there's no doubt that there is a huge amount of variability. So if you look at just the first um, you know, bit of time, you probably couldn't tell whether or not the the whole line, if you're going to draw a regression line, is going up or down, but um, because there's so much var variability. So even, um, even the last few years, you might have pretty long ice duration, but there is no doubt that the trend from 1850 um, to the present, that there has been a downward trend, meaning that the lakes are covered by ice um, for longer and longer. I'm sorry, the lakes are covered by ice for less and less time. And that is going to do um, a number of, it's going to have a number of effects on, on the lake. And I put in a plug for long-term data, because you never could have had this kind of an analysis unless you had data all the way back from 1850. John Magnuson, if you ever get a chance to hear him, does a terrific talk about climate change and where other evidence is from around the world. There's a wonderful story he's got in Japan where they've also kept track of how long the ice lasts for hundreds and hundreds of years. So uh, what is the problem with um, climate change or with warming and our lakes? Well, the thing is that water, uh, the temperature is kind of the master controller of everything that's happening. Um, it controls how much oxygen is dissolved. It controls how fast fish grow and whether or not what fish can grow. Some fish like it warm, some don't. It, it speeds up reproduction of algae and, and zooplankton, and it speeds up nutrient cycling. So everything just gets kind of ramped up. And temperature is vitally important for fish. Um, you know, we've got trout down here that, and salmon that really like it good and cold. And then you've got um, uh, panfish up here that like it warmer. And if uh, there's a good chance that we will be losing these uh, cold water fish as our um, climate gets worse. Another thing is that we've got shoreland destruction going on. We love our lakes, but we like to have them pristine and want them to look like um, maybe they did when you were in suburban Chicago or something like that. And so that is not good for the lakes. And this is a much uh, more natural shoreline and a much healthier lake where you're going to allow that littoral zone to um, foster and be the nursery for all those organisms. There's also pollution. Um, uh, and one of the polluters that we're hearing about more and more is micro, um, uh, plastic micro pellets. I don't think I've got the right word there. Um, that are getting into our lakes. So things that you can't even see, but there is pollution. And then finally, we've got lake level changes. This is not necessarily the cause caused by climate, but uh, lakes do go up and down um, uh, in a cyclic way. But um, climate change. 
uh, could exacerbate that because there's going to be more evaporation as the temperatures warm. So with that, I would like to end. And if you have any uh, questions, I would be happy to answer. Have you noticed any noticeable change um, in the fishery on, on Trout Lake because of the spiny water field? The, luckily, on Trout Lake, we do have spiny water fleas. And the question was, how, is there any change in the fish um, on trout? And um, I would say no. The spiny water fleas on trout are at very low densities. It's nothing like Mendota. Mendota, they're probably at the highest concentration any place in the world. So that's a real problem. We have a number of lakes in Vilas, Oneida County, where we do have spiny water fleas. We're kind of keeping an eye on it, but we haven't seen very high concentrations yet. Yeah. Mendota's a chain of lakes. Yeah. Have they noticed any effect in any of the other lakes, or are they just studying Mendota? Uh, they, um, part of the long-term ecological research studies, Wingra and Monona and Mendota. Um, I, so they're being studied, but I can't answer that question. You're going to have to tackle Hillary Dugan or uh, Holly Emke, one of those uh, grad students or, or faculty members from the Center for Limnology. I, I, I don't know what's going on in some of the other lakes. Yeah. What's the impact of nitrogen on the lake? So nitrogen um, is another uh, nutrient. And it's not always, well, for example, um, aquatic plants are rooted in the bottom, and they generally take up nitrogen from the bottom. So they could be enhanced by nitrogen. Also, if you've got plenty of phosphorus coming in, nitrogen is usually the next limiting factor. And so if you've got plenty of phosphorus, nitrogen will then be in abundance, and that can take over. But nitrogen has a bunch of, well, phosphorus as well. They've all got a bunch of forms. Their dissolved um, gaseous nitrogen is not available for algae. They have to fix it. They have to turn it into uh, nitrate, basically. And that's a very um, difficult process that has to be mediated by bacteria and things like that. So um, it's not as simple as nitrogen just getting dissolved into the water, but it could, um, in, it could increase eutrophication. Yeah. Could you explain the relationship between marrow lakes and the lack of phosphorus? Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> so what's the relationship between phosphorus and marl? So a marl lake is very high in calcium carbonate. Um, and uh, my chemistry is not up to speed on that. I'm very sorry. Um, I, I do not know. Are, do you, did you know that they, I mean, are you saying that uh, usually they're lower in phosphorus if they have? Yeah. Uh, There's something about the calcium carbonate, I guess, that Bob, you're, sh you're nodding. You want to take that on? Uh, too many years ago. Um, I'm trying to think of who here, Paul Garrison, if he's around, yes. he would know. Paul Garrison works for Ontario. They've got a booth right outside. Go hit him up. <laughs> Although, Bob, maybe you've got a little more explanation. No, I, I, I wouldn't dare venture. But there are some <laughs> folks here that um, can probably help explain that. But you're right. Usually calcium carbonate lakes are lower in phosphorus and, and not quite so fertile. Yes. Another chemical question. Um, so what would happen if you added like iron oxide to a lake to try and grab phosphorus back up? Would that work? I, I, it has been done. And um, so that is a possibility. And it can keep the phosphorus from recirculating. But then you get whatever is in the lake. And it drifts down. And it kind of, you'll, you'll form a sediment layer. And then you'll, you're going to have to do it again. So it doesn't. Temporary solution. Temporary solution. And uh, yeah. I'm not really a lake manager, so uh, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, lake managers from the DNR that could speak more eloquently about that. Well, let's thank Susan for her presentation. That's